the second part of the introduction to interoception feelings and behavior video we're going to be looking at how the different aspects of the brain and autonomic nervous system interact to influence the experience of feelings and emotions in people's behaviors in order to do this it's important that we understand some of the basic functions of the brain came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain so let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain and this, the wrist of the forearm coming up to here is like your spinal cord and right here at the uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull and here at the bottom of your palm this is like the reptile brain the life support system of the brain so you know if the rest of your brain is wiped out through say for example a stroke or a car accident this life support part of your brain the reptile brain can still keep your body alive can still keep all your organs functioning and your breath and your heart and so forth and this is where a lot of autonomic nervous system operates and stems from this reptile brain. Now, above the reptile brain is the mammalian brain, often called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So reptiles, they've got the fight or flight response or they've got the freeze, shut down, flop and drop response, but they don't really have anything that is even remotely close to the, the complex emotional states that we see in mammals. And the limbic brain has many different parts to it, but two in particular, that we'll be looking at in this course are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Uh, this kind of is the, the middle brain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, basically responsible for emotions. Now on top of the limbic mammalian emotional brain you've got the cerebral cortex, the thinking cap of the brain. The cerebral cortex is much thicker in mammals but especially so in primates and particularly so in human beings more so than any other primate. And this cerebral cortex, the thinking part of the brain responsible for consciousness and cognition. And right at the front of the cerebral cortex you have the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right up here at the front of your forehead above your eyes and particularly important to us is the medial prefrontal cortex this bit in the middle right at the front this bit up here this plays a very important role in mindfulness and awareness so let's just go through it again you've got your spinal cord you've got your reptile brain underneath your cerebral cortex you've got your mammalian brain with the amygdala and the hippocampus responsible for emotions and then you've got your cerebral cortex your thinking cap of the brain on top and the medial prefrontal cortex right here in the center of the front right there. This short cartoon section the cartoons were created by Dr. Russ Harris. In Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain when you lose it or you flip your lid what it's meaning is that your reptile brain is taking over so your survival instinct is kicking in. Now this isn't just fight, flight or freeze behaviour, this can also be su shut down or flop and drop. These behaviours occur because you have gone into sympathetic nervous system overload. So as a species we rely on sympathetic nervous system overload and our survival instinct to keep us alive. So when we were cave people the tiger, saber-toothed tiger could jump out at us and our survival instinct would kick in and if we were amazingly powerful we could probably fight it, if not we would run very fast or we could um, freeze and some large predators actually don't see prey that doesn't move so that served well and in some instances shutting down for example, if you fall into cold water, shutting down is a good idea and flop and drop can help if you're in tall grass and prey flies overhead. Our autonomic nervous system has two main parts to it, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So the activation of these is driven by neurotransmitters, acetylcholine um, increases the parasympathetic nervous system which is our rest and digest and noradrenaline increases are uh, leading to the sympathetic nervous system activity. So when we have an, um, an excess of noradrenaline we get sympathetic nervous system overload which as I said before drives that survival instinct um, kicking in and the reptile brain taking over. So if we go back to part one where we talked about um, 
individuals going from 0 to 100 in a split second is an illustration of poor interoceptive awareness. What do we mean by 0 to 100 as a scale of feelings and emotional intensity? So 0 would be where you have no feeling or emotion and 100 would be the most intense feeling possible uh, which is emotional overload and that is driven by or accompanied by sympathetic nervous system overload so that's your, your noradrenaline in excess, you've gone into sympathetic nervous system overload, your reptile brain, your survival instinct has taken over and a hundred leads to either externalizing or internalizing survival instinct behaviors so the externalizing ones are your fight flight um, and your internalizing are your freeze flop and drop and shut down. So in part one we talked about individuals with atypical interoception not noticing their 0 to 99. So if you think about if you're not aware of um, biofeedback until it's huge, if you're not aware of your body sensations, um, you're not actually going to feel and therefore you're not going to express it until it's it's huge. So the um, yellowy green bars in this represent your autonomic nervous system and as they're tilting up that's an increase in noradrenaline which is driving your sympathetic nervous system and then we've got the hand model of the brain on the other side and as the noradrenaline increases and the um, sympathetic nervous system increases you can see the thinking cap of the brain actually starts to lift off and raise up so as the thinking cap of the brain has raised up that at 99 you have got big emotions so your amygdala the emotional part of your brain you can see the thinking cap of the brain is not covering that at all but the amygdala is still in contact with the um, base of of the brain so that's still you're still in control of that however as it goes into 100, the, that part of your brain, the amygdala, opens up out and the thinking cap of the brain and the amygdala are no longer attached and that means the reptile brain, your survival instinct, takes over and that's when you flip your lid. So as you can see, the noradrenaline has gone up from 99 to 100 and you've gone into sympathetic nervous system overload. So in terms of emotions and feelings, they start out small, so maybe you know two, three, four, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger um, until we notice them and express them and or do something about them. So we might not notice we're sad when we're just starting to become sad and we might notice it as the, the feeling gets more and more intense and we might do something about it to try and make ourselves feel better. Um, and again with anger, as we're starting to feel anger, we might notice it at a different stage and do something about it. For example, at work, we might do something about it a bit more quickly because we know that it's inappropriate to express anger in the workplace. However, in a family situation, we might leave that anger to a much higher level before we do something about it. We might even be expressing that anger and starting to express that anger in inappropriate ways before we actually do something about it. However, if you don't have an awareness of those feelings and emotions, you don't notice them, um, you're not going to be expressing them until they're really quite big and at that point you may struggle to do something about them because your sympathetic nervous system might be almost at or going into overload so it's very hard to control yourself and self-regulate yourself at that point of overload because your reptile brain, your survival instinct is going to take over. So on this um, diagram, this is uh, explaining how that all links together. So something happens to you and if your survival instinct kicks in straight away what happens is that drives your action response behavior which is that survival response behavior so that fight, flight, freeze, flop and drop will shut down. However if it is not um, large enough to trigger that then you might have a, a thought you might think, ah, oh, that's a little bit bothersome. Ah, oh, yep, my heart's starting to race. I'm getting a little bit anxious about this. Ah, oh, and that's your emotional um, aspect. 
I think I'm going to walk away now and that's your action or your response behavior so you can see it's a cyclical thing and that action response behavior drives what you're doing which just drives your external environment and the interaction between you and your environment which leads to more thoughts and so on and so forth so some examples of these are that you might notice that it's getting dark and you might have a thought about oh it's probably time to go to bed you might check in with your body notice that yep I am tired I'm going to go to bed now an example of someone with um, low interoceptive awareness is that they're outside and they're in a weather event looking at their hands noticing ah my hands are blue ah there we go unless they actually know that their hands are blue they're not actually going to do anything about it so if you don't know that blue means cold and that means that it's not safe for your body and you need to do something about it you won't necessarily do anything about it and we do see people who are outside in the cold um, with blue fingers and toes and they can indeed get frostbite in countries where it's very cold in Australia we tend to see the opposite where people are out in the heat and they're not drinking enough water and they can um, get very ill and need to be hospitalized and even die from um, heat stroke and dehydration so we need to be aware of what's happening we need to be able to process how that's impacting on our body and the feeling or emotion that goes with that and then respond to that as individuals develop their interoception they start to notice those emotions before they're huge so they start to, to notice them before 99 and as they start to notice them earlier and earlier it means that they can actually do something about it so in terms of the hand model of the brain the thinking cap of the brain starts to lift up up oh, notice it's lifting up do something about it bring it back down again so in terms of developing interoceptive awareness say somebody takes um, a backpack from by your chair you might have that thought why why did that person take my backpack and then as you're developing interoceptive awareness you might notice at that point that your heart was racing you had sweaty palms your breathing rate had increased and that could be interpreted as a number of different emotions say for example it's fear that you're never going to see your backpack again you could then do something about that um, to express that fear and it might be that somebody walks past with a similar backpack and you might hit them now for some people with lower interoceptive awareness if they were particularly attached to their backpack as somebody took it and walked away that rage and fear could be spiked but they might actually not realize that it's rage or fear and they might go almost instantaneously into sympathetic nervous system overload and hit them so you can see how having a small amount of interoceptive awareness or a, a trauma response that's very quick um, can have the same kind of outcome but that it slows it all down a little bit if you have really good interoceptive awareness I hope that this video has been um, a useful second part to the introduction on interoception feelings and behavior and can you, s you can see how they all link together